Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to the United Parish. I'm the Reverend Johnny, and uh, if this is your first time joining us, then know the welcome of our church family. I'm currently in uh, Christ Church in the building in uh, Ballymuir, um, but this is not the church. This is simply a, a building in which we worship in. It is stone and it is mortar. It does not define the church. What defines the church are God's people gathered. Uh, we haven't been able to do that for a number of months uh, physically, but I'm able to announce this morning that uh, as of Easter Sunday morning, we will gather again in our church buildings. Yes, there will be restrictions on numbers uh, and with all of the health and safety that comes with that, but we will be starting to gather again. So I would encourage you in the next week or so as the booking systems come online uh, and the ability to phone up uh, and to book your place um, that you consider uh, doing that. Um, but there'll be more details of that uh, in the next week or so. Also on Easter Sunday morning, we normally have our dawn service in St Augustine's grounds in Bally Easton. But again, for regulations, we are not permitted to gather in large uh, quantities at that. So as an alternative, what I'm going to do is we're going to celebrate communion. I'm going to uh, be in Bally Easton uh, and, and offer communion as part of a dawn service. And what I would encourage you to do at home is to join with us as we celebrate uh, uh, around God's table uh, in communion. As we come this morning, we are in a period of Lent and we are journeying uh, very quickly towards Holy Week. A week in which we consider the ultimate punishment and the sacrifice that Jesus would uh, bring on himself because of his deep, deep love for us. But one of the glories and great things about uh, the gospel is that because of what Jesus has done for us, we have access to the throne room of God. The invitation that we have to confidently approach God and receive his mercy and his grace is what sets us as Christians apart from any other religions that are out there. This call to worship reminds us of the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ who came and died for our sins to redeem us and restore us to the Father. So listen to these words of, uh, that remind us of that. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast uh, our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What a wonderful confirmation this morning that as we worship, we come before the throne of God through Jesus Christ. So before I hand over to the reeds to lead us in our worship, let's pray. Let's pray for the invitation of God's Holy Spirit this morning. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to come and to worship you in spirit and truth, even though we might be still distant. And thank you this morning for the news that we're going to be able to come back together physically uh, again. Lord, as we journey through our worship this morning, may your spirit speak into our hearts. Would we, Lord, um, give our everything in worship to you, to proclaim you as our King and as our Messiah. Thank you, uh, Father, for what you have given us through Jesus Christ, that access to you this morning. And so with the angels and with the archangels, we declare you are holy and you are most worthy to receive all our praise and all our honour. 
In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
Thank you to the Reeds for leading us. In this time of Lent, and in particular as we move closer to Holy Week, we mustn't look at the Passion story and think that that was a story about other people. We can place ourselves into that story. When we consider how Judas treated Jesus, when we consider um, how Peter turned his back on Jesus, then each one of us can put ourselves into those positions and think of how we have failed our Lord. And so in a time of confession now, we're going to bring uh, our regrets, we're going to bring our uh, concerns about how we have lived our lives before a God who is willing to forgive. And so the words are going to appear on the screen as well with me. Father, you know who and what we are and what we are not. You know our confusion and our folly. You know our strengths and our shame. You know our professions of hope and just how quickly we lose heart. You know our failure to stand firm on the faith we proclaim and our criticism of others who fail. You know our complaints when we suffer and our refusal to share one another's hurts. You know our self-satisfaction, our self-interest and our selfishness and the conflict between our good intentions and our love of the easy way forward. You know the battles we failed to win because we were never quite sure just whose side we were on. Forgive us that we lose the struggle so easily because we insist on standing in our own strength and not in our Lord's. Forgive us, restore us and reclaim us as your own through Christ. Amen. And the wonderful promise that we have from Scripture is that God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. As we begin to open God's word this morning, we're coming near the end of our, uh, our whole study of the book of Acts. We're a couple of weeks away from finishing. And I'd like to thank the many people who have contributed to this series, which has been extremely useful. This morning, I want to thank uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Alan Wilson. Dr. Alan Wilson uh, is no stranger uh, to many of you um, and is someone who uh, lectures in Belfast Bible College uh, and is known very much uh, for uh, the opportunity to speak in many different conferences uh, and churches around the country. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to hand over now uh, as we read God's word and then over to Alan as he speaks to us. The reading is taken from Acts 24, verses 1 and verses 10 to 21. The trial before Felix. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defence. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. 
After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they find in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning and it's good to be with you this morning. This week, many of us have been thinking about the story of a man whose life had such a massive impact on his world that he still talked about today. I'm recording this the day after St. Patrick's Day. That's the day when people all around the world attempt to identify an ounce or two of Irish blood so that they can have an excuse to wear green and eat cabbage and Irish stew. Now, the man himself, Patrick, had a remarkable faith and a remarkable relationship with God. And of course, he was very influential in the spread of Christianity in Ireland. On his own account, he baptised thousands of Irish people who had turned to believe in God. Today, however, we're going to talk about another man who lived a few centuries before Patrick and who made an even greater impact on his world and whose influence is still deeply felt. If you've been following the story of Acts, you'll know that from chapter 9 on, much of the focus is on the part played by Paul in the spread of the gospel and the establishment of the church. And in chapter 24, which is our focus today, Paul has run into trouble with the Jews in Jerusalem. And he's been shipped off to Caesarea on the coast, where he encounters Felix, the Roman governor. The first nine verses of the chapter feature Tertullus. He's a lawyer. He's representing the Jewish religious leaders. And you'll notice that he makes several accusations against Paul. So he calls him a troublemaker in verse 5. Literally, he's a pest. He claims, secondly, that Paul has been stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He describes him as a ringleader of what he calls the Nazarene sect, the followers of Jesus. And he accuses him of attempting to desecrate the temple. And that's a reference to something that happened in chapter 21. Now from verse 10, Paul gets to defend himself. And in verse 21, instead of trying to reach a verdict, Felix decides to kick for touch and he orders Paul to be kept under guard. And then from verse 24, it becomes more personal as Paul talks to Felix about Jesus and the implications of the gospel. I want to focus on three things about Paul in the chapter. One is a bit about Paul the man, two is something about his motivation and three is something about his message because we get a summary of how he engaged personally with Felix and with his wife Drusilla. Now in terms of Paul the man we know quite a bit from various parts of the New Testament. For one thing we have what Luke tells us about him in Acts. For another, like Patrick whom we mentioned at the start, Paul wrote things down we have various letters that he wrote to churches and individuals. And I want us to notice what he says about himself here in Acts 24 in his response to the accusations of Tertullus and the Jews, how he describes his faith. Now, interestingly, in spite of the hostility of the Jewish leaders, he had quite a bit in common with them in terms of his beliefs and his religious background. Like them, verse 14, he worships the God of his ancestors, the God who called Abraham. Like them, secondly, he believes what is written in the law and the prophets. That's shorthand, if you will, for what we call the Old Testament. Paul accepted what was written there and he believed its promises. And like them, at least like some of them, because the Jewish leaders were divided in this one, he had a hope in God that there would be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In terms of his upbringing and his basic beliefs, Paul was a good Jew. In fact, he had been brought up as a Pharisee. Now, we tend to have a somewhat negative impression of the Pharisees. And part of that is probably because of the way they opposed Jesus. And partly it may also be because we might struggle a bit with their legalistic attention to detail. But if you wanted to find someone who took the observance of God's law seriously, find a Pharisee. They fasted, 
and they tithed. They were anxious to get things right. Now, if you visit Israel today, you will still find people who take obedience to the law very seriously. I've been there a couple of times and on both occasions, the small group of people I was with was accompanied by a wonderful Jewish guide whose name is Josh. We had some great conversations. We talked about the debate about whether squeezing the juice from a lemon was classified as work. For if it is, and you are a serious Jew, you'd better not squeeze a lemon on the Sabbath. On Friday evening, Josh had to be home before sunset because that's when Sabbath begins. And so you need to make sure you have your meal prepared and you need to have an arrangement for Saturday because on Saturday you're not going to be able to switch on the electricity to cook anything, at least not manually. And if you stay in a hotel, you'll find a Sabbath lift. It's programmed in such a way that you don't need to press the buttons. These are people who are deeply concerned to do things right. And that amount of detail may seem to us like a heavy burden, but it's very hard to criticise their zeal. Now to get back to Paul, it's interesting that in his letter to the church in Philippi, he talked about his religious credentials and he said that in regard to the law, he was a Pharisee. But Paul doesn't stop here. There's something more about how he describes himself in Acts 24, or more specifically, how he describes his worship. In verse 14, he admits that he worships the God of his ancestors as a follower of the way, which his opponents call a sect. It's the same God, it's the same Old Testament, but something has changed. Paul has met Jesus and Jesus has turned his world upside down. This is the Jesus who is the way, the truth and the life. His people are those who have understood who he is and who have set out on a journey of following him. It's a new way of living and it's a new way to life. And for Paul, all of his religiosity, no matter how sincere and how heartfelt, it's become less than nothing in comparison with Jesus. No longer will Paul seek to build his life and his acceptance with God and his own achievements as a fanatical law keeper. He's building his life on Jesus. I wonder where we look for our identity and our status. Is it in our education? Is it because we've come from a good family? Is it in the colour of our passport? And where do we look if we want to be accepted by God? Is it the depth of our commitment to religious observance? What happens when Jesus interrupts us so that in the final reckoning, none of that counts, that what counts is knowing him? That's Paul, the man. Now, we need to go further and say something about his motivation. And I'm thinking particularly here of verses 15 and 16. Here they are again. Let me read them. I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Now, as I said earlier, the Jews were divided on this. Many of the ruling class were part of a group called the Sadducees. And as Luke tells us in chapter 23, these people were the anti-supernaturalists of the Jewish world. They didn't believe in a resurrection, nor did they have any space in their thinking for angels or spirits. On the other hand, as Luke says, the Pharisees believe all these things. Now, of course, the big point of difference between Paul and the Pharisees was the resurrection of one specific individual, Jesus of Nazareth. Paul was convinced he was alive. After all, he'd met him. And the fact that he was alive changed everything about who he was. For Paul, it was a declaration that he was the son of God. It was a sign that God would judge the world through him. And Paul believed that not only would the righteous and the wicked be raised, but that he and we would have to appear before the risen and exalted Jesus. And that wasn't an abstract piece of theological information that had no relevance to how Paul lived his life. He knew he was accountable. There would be a day where he'd have to give an account of how he had lived. And it was because of that, because that was a vivid reality for him, that he did what he could to maintain a clear conscience before God and man. Listen to what he wrote about this in another of his letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home, in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. 
And you might like to add Romans 14, 12 to that, where he says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Sometimes we'd like to think that life is free of consequences. We can live whatever way we choose and as long as we don't hurt anyone, we're fine. But Paul knew that he would be held to account and because of that, he worked to maintain a clear conscience and made it his goal to please Christ. Whether he lived or died, that was the aim of his life, pleasing Christ. What a wonderful thing for someone to live like that. And when they reach the end of their life, the life that's been entrusted to them by God, they hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me add a few words from Patrick. Here's something that he wrote. He said, although I'm imperfect in many ways, I want my brothers and relations to know what I'm really like so that they can see what it is that inspires my life. I'm not ignoring the evidence of my Lord who testifies in the psalm, you destroy those who speak lies. And again, he says, a mouth which, kill, a mouth which lies kills the soul. And the same Lord says in the gospel, the idle words which people speak, they will account for on the day of judgment. So I should greatly dread with fear and trembling this sentence on that day where nobody can avoid or escape, but all shall give complete account of the least of sins before the tribunal of the Lord Christ. Like Patrick, Paul believed in the resurrection of the dead and that was his motivation for living well. But what about his message? Well, there's a shift between verse 23 and verse 24 in the way Luke tells the story. Uh, in verse 24, the scene is set for some more personal interaction between Paul and Felix. Evidently, they had a number of conversations. I don't know what kind of personal interest Felix had in Paul's faith. Luke says that Felix was well acquainted with the way. And I'm sure that conversations with Paul would have added to that. But it seems that a lot of his motivation for going back to talk with Paul was his hope that Paul would offer him a bribe. History tells us a bit about Felix. He was not of noble birth and his political success seems to have had more to do with the influence of his brother. He married three wives, all of them from royal families. The third was Drusilla, who features in our chapter. She was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I and apparently as a teenager, She'd been married to the king of Emesa, but Felix had stolen her away, allegedly with the help of an Egyptian magician. In terms of how he handled power, Felix could be ruthless. Tacitus, who was an ancient historian, said that he exercised the power of a king with the mind of a slave. Now, what message would you have for someone like that? How would you witness to a powerful and corrupt person? Paul was incredibly bold. Now, I doubt that he would have thought there was anything incredible about it, but he wasn't phased by his audience. There was no sugarcoating, no playing down the challenge. In general terms, he talked about faith in Christ Jesus. That's where Felix and Drusilla needed to get to. It's where all of us need to get to. That applies whether we're the most powerful person in the land, whether no one outside our family has ever heard of us, or if we're just somewhere in the middle. Paul's mission was to see people commit themselves in faith to Jesus Christ, the Son of God who was crucified for their sins and then raised again. Now, gospel means good news, but it's also a message that brings a challenge. And you notice that as Paul talks, he zeroes in on three themes that Felix and Drusilla had to consider. Number one, righteousness. God is righteous. So what happens if we're not? Number two, self-control. That was quite something to talk about with someone like Felix. I doubt that it was one of Felix's qualities. And third, judgment to come. I suppose in some ways you could turn a blind eye to righteousness or to self-control if you knew there was never going to be any accountability. But as we've already seen, Paul believed that both the righteous and the wicked would be raised. There was judgment to come. And I think Felix must have had some flicker of conscience. You can tell from the way he reacted. Verse 25 says he was afraid. Old translations say that he trembled. Another modern translation says he was alarmed. Something of the reality of facing the judgment of God had pierced his armour and he was afraid. And I think it would have been a remarkable thing for him to fall on his knees there and then 
cry out for mercy and put his faith in Christ Jesus. But he didn't. Again, he kicked for touch. Enough for one day, I'll get back to you. And there's no evidence of him ever again coming as close to getting right with God. And that's why when we sense God nudging us to get right with him, to put our faith in Jesus, we need to pay attention because the moment may never again present itself. I began with Patrick. I'll finish with some more of his own words. Like Patrick, Felix, uh, like Felix rather, Patrick faced the challenge of the gospel. Unlike Felix, he responded positively. Here's what he says. I was taken into captivity in Ireland along with thousands of others. We deserved this because we'd gone away from God and did not keep his commandments. We would not listen to our priests who advised us about how we could be saved. The Lord brought his strong anger upon us and scattered us among many nations, even to the ends of the earth. It was among foreigners that it was seen how little I was. It was there that the Lord opened up my awareness of my lack of faith. Even though it came about late, I recognized my failings. So I turned with all my heart to the Lord my God, and he looked down on my lowliness and had mercy on me, mercy on my youthful ignorance. He guarded me before I knew him and before I came to wisdom and could distinguish between good and evil. He protected me and consoled me as a father does for his son. That is why I cannot be silent nor would it be good to do so about such great blessings and such a gift that the Lord so kindly bestowed in the land of my captivity. This is how we can repay such blessings when our lives change and we come to know God to praise and bear witness to his great wonders before every nation under heaven. Good morning. We'll start with the colic for the fifth Sunday in Lent. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world. Grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear God, in this season of Lent, let us be encouraged to read and meditate on your word. Examine our lives and repent of our sin and realise a fresh understanding of the sacrifice you made for us, dying on the cross and reassurance of forgiveness. Lord, enlighten the eyes of our heart that we might see you and notice how you're at work through our lives. Give us wisdom to make the best choices. Fill us with a desire to seek after you more than anything else in this world. We thank you that you forgive our feelings and we ask you to graciously give us a spirit of love and forgiveness that sees only the good in each other, that bears no grudges and forgives all grievances. May we learn to forgive even as you have forgiven us, that we may live together in unity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, we bring before you our community. Protect and strengthen the brave people serving others on the front lines of this pandemic. Give our leaders wisdom as they navigate this season. Let your hope and truth guide their actions. Restore communities for the glory of your name and rescue people from depression and loneliness. Lord, we lift those families in our parishes that are struggling with loss of family members, loss of jobs, and loss of health. Sometimes we feel like our lives have been marked by such grief and pain. We don't see how our circumstances can ever change. Lord, rise up within us. Let your spirit shine out of every broken place. Lord, thank you that in the storms of life you say to us through your word in Mark 60, 50. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, let the spiritual renewal we've experienced during this pandemic strengthen our resolve to share your hope and see your goodness in our land. Therefore, let us follow Paul's example, using every opportunity to witness for Christ, because we know you are at work in our lives. Bless Reverend Johnny, Reverend Alan, Diane, 
David and all those working within our church and community. Unite your global church. Increase our gener generosity, faith and love for those around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We conclude our prayers joining together saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, folks, thank you for joining us this morning. Before our, our final song, can I just remind you about Easter Sunday in particular? And on Easter Sunday evening as well, um, we're going to have a drive-in Easter celebration involving all the churches in the town. Uh, and so you'll be able to book in for that uh, in the coming days. So again, uh, look out for, for that. Just as I, I, I finish, I'm just going to pray the blessing, and I'm going to use the ironic blessing which is found in the book of Numbers. I think it's really important that when it comes to blessing, that the blessing that comes is from God. Yes, we can bless one another, um, but more importantly is the blessing that God gives us, and he gives us that each and every day through his love and his mercy. So let me pray um, the blessing that comes from God on us into this day. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen.